Hello and welcome to the second session of Global Sources Virtual Summit, April 2021 for online sellers. If you are an Amazon seller or if you are a brand or a retailer who wants to sell online, you should definitely join us for this summit because we have over 15 speakers who are talking about what's working in e-commerce now. Now, today we are doing the second session of the summit and uh, if you joined us earlier today for the first session, uh, we, had, we had told you that there are going to be five sessions of the summit overall over the next three days. And um, the next session is going to be held tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Hong Kong time. Um, and then the session after that will be held at 8 p.m. tomorrow, Hong Kong time. So today we've got three presentations lined up for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about content engagement. We're also going to be talking about some sourcing best practices in 2021. I also want to remind all of you to register for the conference if you haven't already done so. Of course, this is a free conference. We're streaming it live on Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn. But if you do want to get access to all of the slides that the speakers are sharing, all the uh, all of the agenda of the conference, as well as the replays, then go ahead and sign up for the conference at globalsources.com forward slash summit. Once you sign up, you'll receive a confirmation email that will have all of the information about the agenda, the speakers, and then we'll send out the replays after the summit is over. All right, so let's get into the content straight away. I'm going to invite our first speaker, Devir Cohen from Easy Commerce. He's joining us from Israel. Hi, Devir. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you for the introduction. How are you? I'm doing great. It's so nice to finally have you speak at Global Sources because you were supposed to come to Hong Kong a couple of years ago. That didn't happen. Then I was supposed to go to Israel. That didn't happen. So finally, we meet here virtually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but it will happen eventually. Yes, absolutely. So guys, I also want to remind you to ask any questions that you might have uh, while Devir is presenting. You can type your questions in the comments, whether you're watching from Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, definitely feel free to <coughs> type in your comments, post your comments or your questions. And um, yeah, Devir will answer the questions after the presentation. So Devir, why don't you start uh, sharing your screen? And then let's let's get started. Okay, great. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. And today we are going to speak about content engagement. Um, do you want to do full screen? Do you want to make the slides full screen? It's, it's so full. It's full see? screen. It's full screen. Don't you see um, full screen? No. Mm, wait a second. The... I will. I will just yeah. stop sharing and then again we'll try to do sharing again. You see all the full screen? No, it's still this the smaller one. Do you want to just mm -hmm. press the button at the bot bottom and see if it uh, you know the full screen button at the bottom on the bottom right hand side if that works? Let me try something else right here. Do you see now full screen? Yes, now we see full screen. Great, Perfect. okay, As great. Well. So welcome to content engagement. My name is Dvir Cohen. I live in Israel. I married plus three kids. I've been doing e-commerce for uh, around 15 years. I'm uh, the CEO of a company called Easy Commerce. Uh, I own a big uh, private label branch and uh, around 130 children Kindle ebooks. My company is guiding businesses to sell on Amazon and other e-commerce platforms. So this is not going to be a high level lecture, which means if you have any question, we you can ask question at the end. And what I can uh, suggest you is to write down the action items and the information we are going to show you. And really important is you to do it, uh, which means act. And of course, if you have any kind of question, you can uh, reach out at uh, uh, this information. You can send an uh, you can send us an email or contact uh, through my private line. So, 
Content engagement. Why do we need content engagement? Let's say we sell on Amazon, eBay, or other marketplaces, or let's say we have a standalone site like Shopify, Magento, etc. Why do I need content engagement? There are a few re reasons we need content engagement. Reason number one is because of the glass ceiling, the cap. No matter if we are selling on Amazon, eBay, Etsy, or any other platform, there is a glass ceiling uh, that we, it's very uh, important uh, for us to break this uh, glass ceiling in order to bring more sales. And it's not, it doesn't matter how much money we will invest in PPC and other marketing, there is a, 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 a glass ceiling, a cap, that we need to bring more customers outside of this uh, platform. If you have a standalone si a brand site, you need to say, hey, I am here. You need to reach for your customer and bring them in into your site. So this is reason number two that we need content engagement. And reason number two is because your competitors do this. So we need to do that also. So we have a brand and let's say that we have a content. So my question is, how do I create the engagement, how do I create the combine and the engagement between the content and the brand? The answer for this question is we use social platform, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and etc. Before we will uh, uh, drive into the, uh, the details, I want to show you some really important numbers about social media. How many people use social media? There are 3.2 billion social media users. Uh, this is a, a amazing number, really, really big number. And this, be, re, these numbers are before the COVID-19 period. 68% of the people are using Facebook. So Facebook is still the, uh, the market leader in uh, doing promotion and bring, me, and bring more customers and do content engagement. We can see social media user by generation, 90.4% of the millions that using this uh, uh, social, 77.5% is Generation X, and of course, uh, almost 50% of the baby boomers. On the average time spent on social media per day, I know I'm 24 seven, so this slide is a, a little less than what I'm uh, using, but the average is two hours and 22 minutes per day, is spent on social networks and messaging. 73% of marketers believe social media marketing has been somewhat effective or very effective for their business. It means that brand owners feel and know that they need to be on the social media marketing and do content engagement. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, 54% of social browsers use social media to research product. People today buy products and search from products, not on Amazon and not on Etsy, on Google or any other uh, places, but on social media. And you probably know that on Instagram, Facebook, and, uh, and so on. 71% of consumers who have had a positive experience with the brand on social media are likely to recommend the brand to their families and friends, which means if I'm doing a good content engagement and I have a, a, a good rate, good uh, customer experience on my social platform, on the content I'm doing, so it's very good for my brand because these customers are probably 71% of them will probably will recommend my product to their brand, to their family. <clears throat> of course, influencer, 49% of consumers depend on influence recommendation, and this is a big market, and the influencer market and the industry is just uh, raising from day to day. And of course, Instagram, I want to show you a, a huge number, how Instagram is very important. From January 2017, there was there was there was 150 million stories. Two years later, 500 million, and today there is a, around three a, three times than 500 million a, up to date to January 2021. And of course, social media users, 
91% of the people use their uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube through their mobile. This is very important and we will speak about it later. So the system, <clears throat> I have a brand and I have a content and I want to do a content engagement. So let's see what we are going to speak about. Now, this is very huge a uh, subject and it is very important subject that is very hard to take this uh, all the uh, um, uh, topics and you know to push it into a 45 or 40 45 minutes lecture but uh, these are the most important things and as i mentioned before write down and ask question if you have the system is three phases phase number one think on content intention phase number two design and write the content and phase number three is publish, but this uh, it doesn't stop here. Why? Because after I publish, we need to do an analyze. We need to analyze the, re the result of the publish of my content and to do adjustment in uh, any way. And we will just uh, go phase by phase and see what, uh, uh, what are the topics of each one. Content intention. In phase number one, the content intention, uh, I'm asking myself, myself, what is the intention of the content? What is the message that I want to uh, address to my customers? And let's let's take an example, this tree of life, uh, age-defying beauty, uh, and let's see what kind of content intention I can uh, put on it. I can offer a pro-age viewpoint, I can say aging is not a bad idea. I can have a discussion on the beauty, okay? I can say, no, let's not cover up. Let's celebrate age, okay? I can share people experience like gray, silver air, under eye circles, and of course, I can create and share um, experience. And uh, of course, so, I'm writing down, down all the content intention, all, all the things I want to address. And it's very important to know what is the message we want, we want to convey, uh, convey with our audience. What is the message that we want to address and to uh, send to our customer before I'm starting to design all the graphics and the email and all the other stuff. So phase number one, content intention. Now, this is really hard a phase where can i find any kind of a source to know what is the a, a intention of my content so i can get inspired by youtube i can get inspired by phones like where i am etc i can check on amazon reviews of my competitors a, or, or on my own products what people are saying in order to get to gather and to write down the content intention. I can look on competitors' website. I can look about on Facebook group. In this case, I can look about Facebook group, which uh, discuss about beauty, aging, and stuff like that. I can check industry statistics, very important. And of course, I can get inspired by uh, looking at how it's made, how the product is made behind the scene, and uh, uh, these are really the list of the uh, uh, sources that I can get inspired in order to create content intention. So if we are returning to the system, phase number one, we want to think what is the intention of the content we want to address our customer. Phase number two, design and write the content, and we just begin. Phase number three, publish, and phase number four, analyze. Okay, let's look on phase number two, design and write the content. In this phase, I'm sitting down with my team and starting to design and starting, and starting to write the content and how the content will be uh, shown and how I will deliver it to the customers. So let's speak about content types. I can have product reviews. I can have contact type which is material of made of. I can have a contact type which is article and information. I can have contact type of quotes, shared experience, which is also called as unboxing, and also video is, is a really other great uh, kind of content. And by the way, video, I can take each one of these five topics 
and make it as a video. Let's see some examples, okay? So I have this product and I want to create something like called product review. So I'm taking this product review from my own site or in this case, it's from Amazon. I copied it and I put it, I creating a new image with the a product on the left and the review uh, on the right. And this is a context I created. And then in phase number three, we will see how we publish this context. Another example, another customer of mine, which sell a, 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 a candle, I'm searching, I'm taking one of the reviews and put it, it in a image. And then I can uh, create this image and use this as a context. Another thing is quotes. Let's say uh, C.S. Lewis, someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. I'm taking this quote and put it on my product and the meaning is different. Um, and of course, there is have to be any kind of combination. And this is a smart quote for this product. Of course, not every product can uh, I can put this kind of a, a, a quote but quotes are another way to do content engagement and create it. Of course, made of and materials, I, a, an image we are using about taking the product and a, I'm starting to write what are the ingredients of this product, what is made of and what is benefits. Uh, so this is also a content we can create. On a f and of course, unboxing, I want to show you a uh, something uh, uh, which is called unboxing. One minute, please. Okay, and what we see here is unboxing on a, of a chocolate called Max Brenner, and I want to show you our original this unboxing and the effect it, it is doing. I don't think we we can't hear the audio. Do you want to try again? Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. The boy RDR is doing a okay. Max Brenner chocolate review. That's right, Max Brenner chocolate review. Now, this was sent to me by a good, good, good person, Angel Padillo. He, that's either here or there. Uh, I owe you one, Asia. Anyway, so look at this. This is clean, you know what I'm saying? Nice, beautiful on there. And then it's all decked out on the side. Max Brenner chocolate box already. So let's go ahead and pop this top right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to review all the first aid chocolate box items. Amen. So, man, I'm ready to jump into these real quick. I think I'm going to start with the uh, the nut. So, yes, I will just go back into the uh, slides. And as you can see, this amazing, amazing unboxing, which uh, made a... Uh, Megla, do you see my screen again? My full screen, just a second. Um, not yet full screen but uh, we see your slides and um full yeah, screen it, yes full screen now great okay so i show you the unboxing unboxing and video of a uh, max brenner chocolate and uh, you can search it in uh, youtube and see all it's very original it's very original very a uh, a uh, convince customers to uh, reach this product and don't forget to create content, 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 and content. It is very important to create content in order to do content engagement. So the system, phase number one, think of a content intention. What is the message I want to address to my customers? Phase number two, design and write the content. And I, uh, we just saw a, a few kind of content that I can create. Phase number three is publish. Let's publish. I created the content. How do I publish it to my OA customers? Well, we have three types of audience, buyers, subscribers, and fans. Let's see what 
each of one is um, is is the kind. So buyers, these customers have bought previously from us. We already have their information. Subscribers, are, these are the customers who didn't buy but subscribe to our brand through mailing list. Now, how do I creating a mailing list? Well, there are mailing list, by the way, is one of the most a uh, CTR, a uh, click through rate, um, and is working very, very good if you know how to create good emails. So I suggest if your brand or your business doesn't have today any kind of email, customer's email database, start doing that. So how do I create a new database? How do I grab customer email? So if I have a standalone site, I can use a landing page or a, a subdomain or inside my uh, site. Uh, and I can offer a 10% coupon articles, discount or any other thing. And then the user, the customer entering his email, he subscribe and everything is okay. And I can use his email, of course. But what if I'm selling on Amazon? Amazon is doing uh, our, uh, to us the sellers, they don't uh, give us the customer's details. So how can I get an email? from Amazon customer. So the solution is using a package insert. This is an example of the package insert. The customer get the package insert in the product and he open the product and he say, hey, thank you. Your opinion is count. Let us know what do you think. I want to give you 10%, 15%, 20% for other products. Just scan this QR code and reach, and after we scan the QR code, is reaching again for a landing page is entering his email and I have his email also. So if I'm selling on a standalone site, I need to do any kind of lead generation, grab the email, I can give a discount, a free ebook and, or any, any other thing that is related to your brand and your product. And if you are selling on Amazon, package insert uh, is the way. Type number two of audience, fans. Who are the fans? Fans are people who visited our site. I want to remind you, I'm, we are speaking about three type of audience, buyers. I have their information. They bought uh, for me, subscribers. This one, the subscriber, I just show you to, to my mailing list and fans. The fans are people who visited my site or my Facebook page, LinkedIn, Instagram, and I can retarget them. So we have three types of audience, buyers, subscribers, and fans. And we can retarget these by Facebook or any other social. I want to remind you, we want to do content engagement. We want to address our content to our customers, to our buyers, to our, our subscribers, and our fans. Remind it, copy it, write it down. We want to give the right to communication to the right person at the right time. I repeat that this is very important and I will explain it in the next slide. I want to give the right communication to the right person at the right time. Let's imagine that we have two types of subscribers on the left and on the, on the right. On the left, I have subscribers that I send them an email, they click on my email, they visited my site, but they didn't buy anything. On the right side, I have subscribers which click on my email, but didn't visit my site. Now, as a manager of a content engagement, I want to send a different type of content to the left side, to the left group, and a different content to the right side because to the left one, I can say, hey, I saw that you visited my site, they didn't buy, hey, I want to give you 10% deal 24 hours today, okay? For example, this message is not good for the group on the, on the right side. So how do I split the subscribers? How do I divide it? The solution is called segmentation. And what is segmentation? Segmentation is the best way to deliver a unique message to customers based on what we already know about them. We can segment group of people based on behavior, event, properties, and of course, location. 
One of the tools that we can segment is called Clavio. We can also do that in MailChimp or any other kind of email platform. Uh, we use the, both of them, also Clavio and also MailChimp. Write it down. There is a free uh, tool. Uh, you can use it. And Clavio helped me to take this scenario, which I want to retarget by a subscriber and fans and do the segmentation. Okay, I can inside the subscriber, I can address specific people uh, uh, to address them a specific content engagement. So remember that don't just, you know, do a bulk uh, post and send the same message to all your subscribers or your email um, list or any kind of uh, data that you are using. Uh, do segmentation, speak with them in a, a, the specific segment a event and, and a, a, as we saw earlier. So another thing that we can do in order to publish, it's called email marketing. Now email marketing is a huge subject and uh, I want to uh, show some uh, really important topics about email because emails are really great as a content engagement <coughs> we want to show a, we want to show a, you a template this template is working we are using it for a long period write in that write it down and if you will use it you will see a huge huge uh, difference in uh, the open rate and the click through rate and uh, everything else that you measure uh, so here are the elements or the emails okay each email I'm sending to my customers, mostly, will have the following uh, segments. One, branded header with a tagline. Number two, headline. Number three, sub-headline with link CTA, CTA call to action. Number four, image call to action. Number five, button call to action. Number six, main content with link CTA, call to action. Signature with tagline and contact info. It's amazing. I see a lot of people sending, a lot of business sending, you know, a, a email and, and trying to do content engagement, but they forget or don't put in their contact info. Final button, call to action, social icon and links, company address, reminder paragraph and brand mission. And of, and of course, unsubscribe link. This is very important because I don't know in the in the, all around the world, the spam, you need to check it. You need to give the ability to your customer, to your subscriber, to your fans, whatever, to be able to unsubscribe from your email list. Okay, let's see some example. I'm writing, I'm writing down, I'm giving you a few more seconds and we will dig in. Okay, so let's see some examples. Branded header with a tagline. What is the tagline? Tagline is a slogan. Is my company, my brand slogan. For example, IQ Builder committed to empowering children. Another example, Nike, just do it, okay? The tagline, the slogan is inside the logo. So each email should start with the branded header with the tagline. After that, headline with sub-headline with link call to action. You have to see this. We just launched our new product and you can see it here. Our new Steam toys can help your kids with building qualities. Okay, the link CTA, call to action is to see it here. Uh, the customer can press it. And after this, image call to action. I put an image call to action. Watch this video about our new submarine in this case in this case uh, the e the image when the customer pressing the image he will see an unboxing movie okay main content okay i started i'm, I'm i want to just show you i started with the branded header after that headline number three sub headline with link uh, call to action image call to action button call to action and now the main content okay I'm, I'm i'm speaking about the main content and here is the main content we just launched our new steam shark toy the shark including final uh, five animals to play with and enjoy watch the video to find out more call to action don't forget 
after the main content, signature with tagline and contact info. Talk to you soon. Kingu Toys, it's not about toys, it's about learning and any other kind of slogan. Of course, contact information, email, phone. By the way, just the, the contact information that uh, we uh, uh, succeed in uh, to find what is a, a, a good template is, is putting the contact information separate from the social links. I'm not going, I'm not putting, you can see, I'm not putting here Facebook links, YouTube links, Instagram of the company. I'm doing that in the next phase, in the next paragraph, okay? This is email and the phone only. After that, look, I'm doing another call to action, another video, it can be the same video. And just after that, I'm putting follow us, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all the social uh, icons, links that you have. And of course, the last is the company address reminder paragraph plus uh, and the brand mission and unsubscribe link, okay? The brand mission is very important. Uh, thank you for supporting Team Good Toys. We try to provide a community for kids who are excited and blah, blah, blah. If you want to subscribe, and stuff like that. Now I want to return to the oil. Remember the anti-aging oil. Look how we combine it. We strive to provide a community for women who are excited about life and ready to celebrate their natural beauty. Your participation in what fuels the pro-age revolution. Remember this slide, which we wrote down the content intention. Okay, pro-aging number one. Offer a pro-aging viewpoint. Look. This is the pro-aging in my email, in my brand mission, okay? I'm right, I wrote this down in phase number one. What is my mission? What is the content I want to address to my customer? And this is the content. This is a, a, how I close the things in the email, okay? So this is a, a good example. And of course, another thing, we are a family. We, a, a, you can see here in the white, okay? Second line from the bottom. We regularly provide coupons, free content, and update from anti-age oil company, a brand mission. Who are we? People are really connected to the story behind the scenes and stuff like that. So it's really, really important to show that on your emails. Another interesting fact about emails, 66% of the unsubscribes queue between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. So... Please try not to send emails between these hours. Do testing, do A-B testing and see what works for you. Uh, and if you remember the big numbers in my uh, uh, previous slide, 91% use mobile. So when you create an email, test it on the desk, uh, desktop view and also on a mobile view. So I return the system. The system is phase number one, think on the content intention. Phase number two, design, write the content. Phase number three, publish. We saw how we published email. And let's speak about social. We can, we can, you know, we can publish our content that we created, the articles, the images that we created on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and stuff like that. But let's say, the left side I want to publish on 8 a.m. in the morning, on Monday morning, and the right side of the screen I want to publish it on Wednesday, on 9 p.m. How do I manage the publication of the content engagement? Let's talk about something called social media automation. Now, we just use application to do that. There are a lot of applications that I can a, a schedule my content and on which platform they will be published. We use Social Pilot, you can use Buffer. There are a lot of uh, uh, application and programs. This is a screenshot of the application of Social Pilot, which you I connect to my social platform and then I schedule what I uh, publish and when I publish it. So remembering the publish to do automation. Another thing, when I'm going to publish a content, it's very important to find the right hashtag. Everyone is working with hashtag these days. Okay, so 
when you publish your content, just find the right hashtag to do that. We can use right tag. You can use hashtagify, uh, and there are a lot of other platforms, uh, applications that you can use to find the right hashtag. But don't don't just you know publish it with a, a not using hashtag. It is very important. So the system to create content engagement. Phase number one: think on a content intention. Phase number two: design, write the content. Phase number three: publish, email, automation. And phase number four: analyze. It is very important <clears throat> to do is to analyze the content, analyze the, uh, uh, the result that uh, my publication uh, is uh, achieved. How many people open the email? How many people click on my Instagram post? How many people click on my Facebook post? Analyze this and if there is any kind of adjustment I need to do, I return to phase number one. And again, I'm thinking, I'm sitting down and thinking, what is the content intention? What is the message? Maybe the image with the quote is not the intention I wanted uh, uh, to, uh, to address to my customer. So there are a lot of analyzed tools out there, out there in the market. Uh, this screen you can see from uh, Facebook uh, analytics. There are uh, other tools like uh, uh, Keyholes and X-Ray and stuff like that, but it's really important that you don't forget to do the analyze phase. Okay, so content engagement, really important to our business in order to grow, in order to break the ceiling glass. Now I can do one million, one million a month in Amazon sales, but there is a cap limit, a ceiling. So if I want to bring more traffic outside of Amazon, even if I'm doing a great PPC and I have an echoes of 8%, 15%, there is a cap limit, there is a, 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 a limit how much traffic I can bring inside the platform. So content engagement is to go outside and bring more customers to my site, to my brand, to my product, uh, and they can sell on Amazon or a standalone side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, first of all, uh, you can contact me uh, at this email, phone number, and on our site. We provide Amazon services and brand building services, and I'm really happy to address and answer each question if you have. Fantastic, Devere. That was a really great presentation. I'm just going to remove your slides from the screen so that we can have you here. That was really great. And I was taking screenshots and I've been taking notes as well <laughs> over here. So okay, we've, got some, <laughs> we've got some comments. Uh, Carolyn saying good info. Suleiman says Thank nice you. presentation. And then hi from Israel. Great speaker. Good information. Yes, absolutely. Great. So guys, if you have any questions about content engagement or any of the uh, information that the uh, shared right now, type your question in the comments, we'll, uh, Devir will be taking questions. I thought some of the things that you mentioned were quite interesting, especially that <coughs> most email unsubscribes happen between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Why is that? I mean, is it because people are, you know, at home, they're looking at their emails and they're, you know, they have just more time to unsubscribe or? I, yeah, I think that maybe people are just awake and they after a, a, a walking day and on the bus and on the metro I don't know and you know, mm. after a, a busy day and uh, I find out by the way that most of the people most of the emails the good emails can will need to be sent in the morning by the way uh, okay. but it really depends it really depends in the content that in the message I want to address so you know every every business need to do a b testing and to see what are the results by time? Right. In terms of days, uh, do you find certain days better? Like maybe weekends, are they better? Of course, it depends on the type of email as well. But if we're talking about e-commerce specifically, um, do yeah. they do better yeah. on the weekends? It, yeah, it's better on, uh, on weekends. It's not good on the first day of the week of the working day here in Israel. It's Sunday. In the US, it's Monday. 
So you know, people are after a, a, the weekend sitting in the, in their uh, job, and the last thing that they want to do is to spend 50 bucks on any kind of product. So this is the, the first day is the most uh, you know um, not uh, converting. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are really good. Um, weekend weekend is good. And uh, by the way, the Q4. Black Friday, Christmas, Prime, Amazon Prime Day, it's a, it's a really big celebration. All the rules are mixed and everything works in, in this period. Mm, right. Okay, Carolyn's asking, do you use funnels? Yeah, yeah, I use funnels. Um, I create, let's say I'm giving a free, I'm doing a giveaway and if I'm selling a jewelry, Okay, I'm doing a giveaway one month from now. I publish this giveaway, only one winner, only one uh, product. I'm doing a giveaway. People will join in, will register, will give their emails. I get their emails and then I uh, do a, you know, a, a random a choose of the winner. And all the ones that didn't win, I have their email. So I send them an email, hey, unfortunately you didn't win but I want to give you 25% to the same, and then I create this funnel this way. Yes. Okay. And do you use any tools to create funnels as well? Or is it just, um, you know, just, just based on like just automation? Well, there are a lot of tools, but I use a uh, Clavio, MailChimp, of course, okay. landing page, and uh, uh, if I if I need to use any kind of click bay, click uh, funnels, so I use click funnels. But uh, you don't need any kind of appli application to do funnels. You can create it with your own, you know, a regular and base uh, application. Right, because there are a lot of tools like click funnels and um, yes, a yeah, lot of right. similar ones as well. Okay, one question from Siran: How can we analyze? your products and check the quality. Um, Sharon, I'm not sure what your question is referring to. Um, so yeah, can you just clarify what exactly you mean over here? <coughs> Maybe you are referring to suppliers. Um, if, if you want to deal, if you want to find suppliers for your products, then you should go to globalsources.com and uh, mm -hmm. search for suppliers over there on our website. So yeah. We're going to just drop that question. Um, so guys, yeah, let us know if you have any more questions over here. We've got the Veer for a couple more minutes um, on the show. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, you mentioned also, I was taking note that um, um, the content intention, the quotes that you mentioned, I think that was very, uh, you know, very interesting. I wouldn't have thought of using quotes for products because usually we see quotes used in social media, you know, as inspiration and everything but yeah this is quite interesting to use quotes for products and, yeah you know um, yeah you know today there are, is a lot of information and a lot of people are trying to do almost the same so i'm trying to think outside of the box and i can take you know really interesting quotes and relate it to the product and when the customer will read it and say hey this is interesting I know this quote and I relate it to the to the product and to the my content intention of course. Right. And are you also using videos on Amazon cuz I think especially for ads I think videos are doing really really well. So what kind of videos are you using uh, on Amazon whether it's for ads or for your products? I'm a, I'm doing really a different again i'm thinking out of the box i'm do okay. doing a <clears throat> i'm doing a a different uh, videos i would try to show you if we have time one minute yeah go ahead i will, yes. I will show you I will, I will show you one of my my one of my uh, customers i will do just a, a share okay. a share screen from tab share audio you taught me <laughs> okay you see this video Yes. Now you yes, see? Played. Yes. Y 
you hear you hear the sound you hear yeah. the sound yeah we heard the sound <laughs> it's okay. almost like music very, you created very, music for yeah the yeah listen 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 to the rhythm by the way yeah Now this cu this customers by the way this customer is a uh, selling packing tapes so yeah. we created a video with the interesting sound of you know of this of the scratch of when I uh, opened the, the the packing tape and amazing really really good uh, you know conversion rate and uh, we we do all kind of videos yes but for your question we do use video everywhere Facebook, Instagram, Amazon products, uh, Amazon A plus contact, my Amazon brand store everywhere I can do, I can I put in a video. That is absolutely fascinating. I really like that idea. Very different and <laughs> really outside of the box. <laughs> okay, cool. So guys, if you have any more questions, um, type you, type them in the comments now and I'm also going to be displaying Devere's email address in case anyone wants to reach out. So you can email Devere at this email address and um, yeah, talk to him. So Devere, apart from um, you know content marketing and all, you also help a lot of clients sell on Amazon, right? So do you want to just quickly tell a little bit uh, uh, you know, about your uh, Amazon consultancy services and how you help brands uh, sell on Amazon? Well, we do. I've been in the Amazon for a long, long years, and today we are uh, helping. It can be individuals, it can be big brands, it can, it can be companies. We just, uh, it depends on the customer. We do everything. We create brands, we uh, scaling a uh, PPC. Um, everything related to the, the Amazon account from A to Z for uh, handling accounts and creating accounts, we can do that. Also, we bring traffic outside of Amazon. We know how to scale it uh, by doing branding, by building a brand outside uh, of Amazon. We know a lot of things inside the system, of course, uh, to do. Uh, and if you have any kind of question, or you can address us at the email on the my mobile phone. We will happy to hear and assist. Fantastic. Well, Devir, thank you so much for your time today. It was a lot of information, and yeah. uh, I'm sure everybody found it very useful. And you could probably do a whole workshop <laughs> on just this one topic. <laughs> thank you very much. And next yeah. time. We need to go to the, you remember, to the safari together. Yes, absolutely. I have not forgotten. I'm waiting there, for... There is, there, yeah. there is amazing, amazing safari in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, I, you know, the corona will vanish and we will go to our original plans. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Devir. You have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, awesome. So let's move on to our next presentation now. We've got our speaker waiting backstage, Tiffany Hepburn. Um, I'm going to invite her on stage and uh, there we are. Tiffany, hi, how are you? Yeah, good morning, Megla. I'm great. How are you doing? Uh, good morning. I'm doing well. Um, we've been going for well, this is our second session of the Global Sources Summit today, so oh, it's wow. evening here. <laughs> we did three hours in the morning, and now we're doing another three hours in the evening. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, really excited about your presentation, Tiffany. So, you're going to be talking about how to prevent um, your uh, brand or account to be, uh, you know, suspended to get suspended on Amazon. So. Let's get straight into it, Tiffany. Do you want to start sharing your screen? Yeah. And, um, let's get into it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. So happy to be here. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And yeah. um, just let me know if, um, can you guys see this okay? Yes, we can see them. And uh, you can just go full screen. Okay, and, awesome. Um, yeah, let me see here if this will, okay. This should be full screen now. Is that good? Yes, it's perfect. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to be talking today. My name is Tiffany Hepburn. I'm the founder and CEO 
piece with Amazon, and I'm going to be talking today about ways to avoid um, getting your Amazon account suspended, getting any kind of IP claim, or having other issues. It may affect your account health metrics when you're selling on the Amazon platform. Um, and so this is kind of something that you never want to see when you're selling on Amazon. Um, this is inside of Seller Central, and it'll tell you that your account has been deactivated. Um, and so that means that you can no longer make sales, um, you know, of your products, you know, your listings um, will not be making sales, and um, you'll have that inventory just sitting in Amazon's Fulfillment Center generating those storage fees, and, you know, meanwhile, you're not able to sell to your customers. Um, and so what I want to talk to you guys today about is the SMART goals, which is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And so I'm going to give you guys some um, real simple ways to kind of make sure that your account does not get suspended or that you don't rack up all of these kinds of claims that you can get against um, the items that you're selling on Amazon. And so one thing is, is that when you're getting, when you're getting started and you're opening a new account, and whether it's your first account or it's another account, I know sometimes sellers will have multiple accounts, um, is that you want to have all of your ducks in a row. You want to have all of your documents. And so, you know, whatever country you're selling in, you want to have, you know, a government ID. Um, you want to have, you know, whatever the bank account is. Like, let's say you're, you know, you're doing this as a legal entity, a company. You want to have the bank account established for that. And you want to have the other legal entity documents. Um, that can tie um, what you're showing Amazon that you're opening this account as to those documents. You want everything to match. Um, so that would be the first step. And you want to get all of those documents together before you get started. It's really good to kind of lay it all out and make sure that you have everything ready before you begin to open your account. And so this also applies to whenever you're trying to make changes to your account. So I know sometimes you know, um, there will be, you'll, you'll sell your business or you'll have like a partner come on and there'll be some changes that you need to go in Seller Central and make. You need to update, you know, an address, you need to update a phone number, an email address, and you might need to update the actual legal entity, um, you know, for tax purposes, change it from a social security number to an EIN, things like that. Um, and so basically, before you get started with that, again, you want to go back to having all of those documents together. And you need to think about kind of like an investigator, you know, um, if I'm going to change the name on the account, then I need to have documents so that I, Amazon can verify and understand why that change is being made. And another thing is, is that a lot of times I will see sellers that will open an account. Maybe they already have an account, it's doing well. They open another account and then boom, they're shut with, you know, they're shut down. They're faced with a suspension. And so one of those things is, is that you don't want to have a previous seller account unless you've gotten Amazon's permission. And also, um, I know that Amazon in 2019, said that you don't need to get their permission anymore, but I always recommend that you get their permission so that you have it on file, that they understand what it is that you're doing. Um, and if you are opening an account for the first time, uh, I recommend that you kind of think about in the back of your mind, have you had another Amazon seller account before? Because if you have and it's still active and you've not formally closed it, then it can definitely get this new account that you're, you're opening and starting suspended. Um, and so one of the most common questions that I see is that um, sellers will say, well, what happens if I had a previous Amazon seller account and that was suspended? Can I just go open a new one? And the answer is, is that no, um, you cannot. Now, if you're going to do it in like a legal entity, you have a business partner, they're going to do something like that, then that's fine. But let's say you have a Amazon account that's in company XYZ name and it gets suspended and you want to go open another one in the same company XYZ, you can't do that. You've got to get the original account reinstated. Um, and this is really important to keep in mind because if you do open a new account, you might not, you know, you have a, let's say you have an old account and it's suspended and you open a new account today and it's running fine, you're making sales, you're doing great, you, know, you get brand registered, you're your full force ahead, right? And you think, wow, like I'm just doing so great in my business. But then one day, Amazon's algorithm will catch that old account and tie it with this new account. And then you're going to be faced with a suspension. 
and then you're going to not be making sales and you're going to have to go back to that first account if it is tied to this new account and get that reinstated. Um, so this is something I really say to keep in the back of your mind when you're when you're getting started or you are opening a new account. Um, another thing that I see is that sellers will say, do you need to get um, Amazon permission to open a new account? And like I mentioned earlier, Amazon has said that you don't need to get their permission. However, I always recommend that you do get their permission. I recommend that you open a case and you get it in writing that they understand this is what you're going to do. You also need to keep in mind that the new account cannot sell the same ASINs, the same products as this old account. So if you have two different accounts, you're going to have to sell different products. Um, that is a huge thing that Amazon um, does not allow you to sell the same products on different accounts. So um, another thing is that I would say you want to make sure you get it in writing from Amazon um, in order to open a new account and that if you have a previous account, sometimes sellers will say, how will I know that I have a previous account? I can't remember. Maybe my wife has one. Maybe my, you know, my ex, um, you know, my ex roommate, something like that. Um, maybe I had a former business partner and we, you know, worked out of the same office building. Um, I would say that you really want to go through your email inboxes, whatever email inboxes you've ever had. Go through and see if there's any emails there from Amazon, not as a not to you as a customer, but to you as a seller. See any emails from Amazon seller support, um, you know, saying welcome to selling on Amazon, things like that. I would ask your friends and family, any previous business partners or business um, ventures that you've had. You want to kind of sit down and think about have you ever had an Amazon seller account or those that you've worked with, um, like you've had a previous business partner in the past and they've had an Amazon seller account and you guys worked out of the same office building and now they're no longer working in that office but you're working in that office and then you open an account. All of that can kind of be red flags that will um, potentially get you flagged as, you know, as a new seller and get your account suspended. So this ties into the related account suspensions, and there was a huge wave of related account suspensions in 2020. And what this has to do with is when Amazon does basically flag your account and they are accusing you of having a previous Amazon seller account or a current. So let's say that you have an account right now and it's up and running and it's doing great, and then all of a sudden you get suspended and Amazon is telling you that this current account is tied to another account. Um, and it doesn't mean that that account is suspended, that account could also be operating. So going back to the business partner example that I gave you, let's say that you and a business partner had you know, a, um, an office you were working out of, you're no longer business partners, you know, he had an Amazon seller account and now you've opened one, but the algorithm is able to connect those somehow. Um, and so I'm going to kind of give you guys some ways that that will happen is that you want to think about when you're opening your account, um, what IP address are you using? What is the, um, basically that is tied to your internet provider. Um, so using, you know, um, a VPN sometimes is really useful if, you know, you're um, in like a public facility or a shared facility where they're all using the same Wi-Fi. Um, that could potentially get you suspended because you don't know what other users of that Wi-Fi are doing. If they have seller accounts. So always recommend if you can use a VPN or use a hotspot. A hotspot is even better. And that is basically going to be a device um, such as an iPad, a cell phone, um, where you have data that you're using and your IP address is tied to that device. So if it's like a cell phone um, and you know I'm only going to use that cell phone as a hotspot, no one else is going to have this cell phone, they're not going to use it, that is going to um, have a lower risk of having this related account suspension. Your MAC address, which is tied to the device you're using, so let's say that you know the old business partner used the laptop and they left it and now you're going to use the same laptop, that could potentially get you flagged. Um, email addresses. So, you know, with that old business partner, let's say you guys shared a company domain email address, you know, xyzcompany.com, uh, and they use that domain email address, and now you're going to use it, that could get you flagged. Any kind of legal entity name or an individual's name. So let's say that, you know, you guys had XYZ company, and they had an account under that entity, you're going to have this account, this account under the same company, all of those kinds of things. 
Um, and so um, basically this says singing, but it should say signing. So signing on a public Wi-Fi or a public device, um, I would recommend staying away from that at any and all times. Let's say you're traveling, you're at an airport. Again, I don't recommend using the public Wi-Fi. I recommend using your own Wi-Fi or hotspot. Um, and I would say another thing to keep in mind is that sometimes you'll um, have sellers that will use consulting agencies, you know? And so you want to ask them, are you signing in? It's, I would recommend never giving someone main account access login. Always give them sub account access. And I would also say that best practice is to have that consulting agency ask them, are you using the same email address to sign into my account? For other sellers because that could potentially get your account linked with another sellers in 2020 that was one of the reasons for the mac wave of suspensions um, with related account suspensions because amazon was flagging um, sellers accounts who would use consultancy agencies and they were using these consultancy agencies were using the same uh, email address to log into multiple sellers accounts um, and so another thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about is um, having the ASIN claims pile up on your account. This will definitely put your account at risk of suspension. It's based on sales volume. So the more sales volume you're doing, the less risk you are at of suspension by having just a couple of claims pile up versus if you're brand new and you're getting started, um, you do, don't have a lot of sales volume and you get hit with what's, what's in this image, all of these um, claims, you're going to have a higher risk of chance of suspension. And so you can sign into your account and you can see the sections where it will kind of tell you if you're at risk. Amazon rolled out last year this new account called Reading. It's in beta mode and it'll kind of give you the indication if it's in yellow, it means you're at risk. If it's in red, it usually means that you're already suspended. Um, and you can see here within the account rolled section, it'll tell you that you need to address your policy violation. And so when you do sign in, you can go to the account house section and you're going to see here all of the different claims that you have and it's going to tell you the different categories that they fall into. And so basically you would just log in, you would go to performance tab, you would, uh, when you click on that, it's going to drop down a menu. It's going to show you account health, which is going to be the first option. You're going to click on that and then you're able to see your account health rating. And at the same time, you're able to see what we showed you in the previous image, which is the list of all of the different claims that you have. Um, and so this is like a laundry list of claims. I'm not going to read all of this out. Um, but essentially what this is, is it's going to be a few claims that are um, actual claims that you can get against your seller account. And like I said, the more volume that you're doing in sales, the better metrics that you have um, will have a lesser chance of you getting suspended for having all of these claims held up. But you definitely want to address these claims. You don't want to let them linger. You don't want to ignore them. You don't want to overlook them. It is something that you want to stay on top of. And so a lot of times sellers are like, you know, brands will say, why should I sell on Amazon? Should I just stay off the platform? Should you, should you run with this fear-based mentality? And I would say that you don't want to run your business in fear, but you want to have a healthy understanding that Amazon is a unique platform and they're very customer centric. So in order to offer the best customer service to their customers, you're going to want to make sure that you're in compliance with your products and that you have good account health metrics. So if you're selling a branded item, they want to make sure that you're not violating another brand's um, intellectual property. And so I would say one thing to do and keep in mind is your mindset, having this mindset of being proactive, having this mindset of, hey, let's address these issues in a timely manner. Let's run our business in you know, a proper way following terms of service and not violating other brands' intellectual property. Things like that is going to really just be a great way for you to run your business and to have healthy account health metrics with Amazon. And so one of the questions that I get is, how can you avoid these claims? And so I would say that these claims are not ever completely unavoidable. Unfortunately, you can be doing everything right. You can be crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's. You can be having all your documents completely responsive every time Amazon sends you an email and you have something in your case log. And you can still get hit with either a claim against your ASIN, which is your product, or you can get hit with an account suspension. Um, but I'm going to give you guys some proactive ways, um, more than what I've already given, to kind of prevent this. And I would say uh, one of those things is that you're going to want to respond to all emails from seller support. 
Um, and so those may be direct emails to whatever email address you've assigned those notifications to go to, or it may be within your performance notifications, or also any claims that you see in that account health section. Those are all going to be issues that you're going to want to resolve. Um, and I would say there is a caveat here, and that is that you only want to respond once you kind of know what it is that Amazon's looking for. So you can always send them a response and say, thank you, we acknowledge we received this, we're going to look into this and we'll get back to you. Um, and then once you figure out what it is that they're looking for, um, you can you know, do a, a more thorough response. And then I would say that you want to also follow the tips that we're going to mention on the following slides. And go back and rewatch this presentation and take notes and truly ask yourself, like, are you following everything I've said here um, today? Um, because a lot of times I realize that sellers are not, and then they realize, man, like, I didn't realize, like, using a public Wi-Fi is putting me at risk. Um, so that's just some little simple things you can do. Um, and so again, emails from seller support will kind of look like this. You'll see at the top here, it'll say that your account's been deactivated or your listings have been deactivated. Um, or you'll see here that there's like a report from a rights owner. And so you want to, again, address all of these kinds of emails. So trademark violations are one type of claim that is taken very seriously by Amazon because having a trademark is part of a brand's intellectual property and it's required for brand registry. So one thing I would say is that you don't want to buy generic items that are not actually your items and list on another brand's listing. So let's say you know a major Google brand, for example, is Nike. You don't want to buy something that's generic that's not truly Nike and then you see a listing on Amazon um, that looks like it could be Nike and you want to jump on that listing. And with private label, I know sometimes that doesn't happen because private label sellers, you guys are sourcing, manufacturing, and creating your own brand. But I have seen it happen where what will happen is a seller will say, well, um, I'm going to have my own brand, but I'm going to have this product that kind of looks similar and that could potentially put you at risk for a treatment violation or another type of violation that affects an intellectual property. Um, before you're getting started, I would say whatever are the marketplaces, the countries that you want to sell in, you want to research whatever brand name you're wanting to use and see is that brand name already registered as a trademark in that country. If it is and you want to speak to, I recommend a you know intellectual property attorney to kind of assist you with navigating that. Um, I would also say that whenever you do get your brand trademark registered, you want to have that documentation in a place where you can easily access it. So if you do get a trademark violation, you can easily have that ready for yourself or if you're using an you know, individual to help you, professional, with these types of claims, that you can have that documentation to give to them to submit and appeal these types of claims. Uh, copyright violations are another very common claim that you will see against sellers on Amazon. And again, you could be doing everything right. And another brand or um, seller could come in and say, you're violating my copyright. Your listing you know, is plagiarizing my listing. You're using the same words, the same phrases. And so again, I would recommend that you always want to have original copy. Um, don't copy the listings of others. Um, you know, you may take inspiration from them, but don't copy them. Um, you want to be very clear about, you know, using unique wording and using unique um, things to your listing. Also, you don't want to use stock photos unless they are, uh, uh, you know, available for the public, public use. Um, you don't want to use another brand or another company's images. That would be a violation of copyright if you did use images that you didn't own or that were not, um, will be called for public use then basically you would be at risk of being uh, having a copyright violation on your account. So I always recommend having original photos, um, or if you are using you know, photos um, from your manufacturer, make sure that they're not giving you photos that are uh, copyrighted, that are not of their own. Uh, they don't have the rights to those photos. So another thing is, how do you prevent these issues? I would say, um, you want to digitize all invoices and purchase orders, any kind of documentation that you can, this piece of paper. I recommend that you digitize that and you make sure that when you scan it in and you have a digital copy, um, that it's legible, it's not smeared, it's not faded, um, there's not any kind of shadows on the document. And also, this will not only help you for these kinds of claims, it'll help you in other aspects of your business. And you want to make sure that 
uh, all of that is legible so that it maintains the integrity of the documents. You don't have to go back through a filing cabinet and find all these paper documents. I would say to register your brand as soon as possible and um, to prevent hijackers on your listing and also to maintain the integrity of your brand and to give you better control over your listing. And I would say um, another thing to keep in mind is that when you're doing different shipments of the same ASIN, I often recommend using a different MSU uh, for the same ASIN uh, because basically what that's going to help you do is that if you get a claim against your ASIN, you can take a look at what MSU was purchased and you can potentially prevent having to recall all of the inventory. Um, that can be an issue is if you only have one MSU per ASIN for FBA, then um, you're gonna essentially have to recall all of your inventory in the case of like a counterfeit claim, or you know a customer says, hey, this item is you know the wrong item, I didn't receive the proper item that I purchased, the item I purchased uh, on the listing is doesn't match the item I received, things like that. Um, another thing is that you want to make sure your listings are as accurate as possible. And so what that means is that, you know, everything is correct, um, you know, it's accurately described. Um, if it's a bundle or a multi-pack or it's like a kit that you've put together, um, your images show everything that's actually included. They don't show, um, you know, I know sometimes there's lifestyle photos, but uh, when you're taking just actual images of the photo and putting that on your listing, you don't want to include things that are not in the actual product. Um, let's say that, you know, you're showing, oh, it comes, you know, in a container, it comes in like a case, right? It's, it's bundled and packaged together, and then it doesn't actually come in a case because that could be misleading to the customer. Um, you always want to uh, ship your items in the condition that they're listed in. Um, you know, so a lot of times, generally, it's new condition for private label sellers. And so you want to make sure that your items are properly packaged. They're not going to be damaged in transit to the fulfillment center, or if you're shipping them direct to consumer, um, that you are not, you know, uh, potentially going to have at risk for the carrier to damage those items when they're shipping it to the customer. And you want to make sure that you also stay on top of shipping um, your items in a timely manner, which that would, you would go in within Seller Central and set up your settings for uh, your shipping and handling time. And Amazon will tell you within Seller Central at what date you need to ship your items by. And you want to make sure that you do do that so that, that will um, you know, make the customers happy and not negatively affect your metrics. Um, and so back to what I was saying earlier is that you cannot avoid these issues entirely. It's just a part of selling on Amazon. Um, and I have seen the most experienced sellers, the larger sellers, the sellers that do everything right, that still will be hit with the claims against their ASINs or they'll be hit with an account suspension, which is why you want to be proactive. You want to do everything right that you can, control what you can control, and then also just have all your documentation ready in case you do have to fight these types of claims. With Amazon, um, unfortunately, it is their playground, as they say, so you have to play by their rules. Sometimes their rules are a little bit fuzzy, um, and so that's why it's really good to consult with a professional on what is terms of service, what is allowed, what is not allowed, and with Amazon, another unfortunate thing is that um, you are generally guilty until proven innocent. So if you are a private label seller, you do have your own brand, you are brand registered, and another brand files a claim against you, as let's say that you're violating their trademark, then with Amazon, more likely than not, they're going to suspend your account or block your products, your ASINs, what we call the blocked ASINs, until you do prove yourself to be innocent and not actually um, doing the violation that you've been accused of. So I just wanted to say to end this off that, you know, we're very experienced uh, with East with Amazon. We've helped over 500 sellers with these issues and we can always assist you with any kind of issues or questions that you do have. Um, and again, these issues are not completely unavoidable. Um, so this is kind of the best way to reach us. I know a lot of times um, sellers are like, well, how do you reach us? We are on social media, but the best way to reach us is to just send us an email, which is account help at AceLoopAmazon.com. Um, that will go to, you know, that's the fastest way for us to kind of know who you are and how we can help you. And we are on Instagram and we do have a website. Um, so yeah, we're happy to take any questions, Megla, and I will um, stop sharing and I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, that was fantastic, Tiffany. Oh, my God, such a lot of information. It was like, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope it fantastic. wasn't overwhelming. 
<laughs> no, it wasn't. I've been taking notes and I was like, okay, wow, I didn't know that. So that is uh, really good. So guys, if you have any questions for Tiffany, um, post them in the comments now. Uh, we have a few minutes here and Tiffany is available to answer any questions that you ha might have about um, getting suspended on Amazon. So uh, uh, Tiffany, you know, what does a seller do in case they do get suspended, you know, for a reason. Of course, they're, you know, you have to look at why they got suspended and everything. But, yeah. you know, what what is the most common sort of scenario? And, um, um, you know, what does a seller do if they do get suspended? It's, you know, that's a great question. I mean, I would say if you get suspended, number one, don't panic. Like if you get that email or, you know, you see notification in Seller Central, just don't panic. Um, remember that there are people, there are resources that can help you, such as myself. Um, and I would also say, you know, some of the more common reasons we see, like I mentioned that related account suspension, that's a huge reason I see that sellers will get suspended and they have good intentions. They're not trying to do anything against the rules with Amazon. They simply, like I gave the example with the business partner, they don't understand that Amazon tracks everything like Amazon they have so much data so if you have an account and you're you um, got that account suspended and you try to open a new account which I I've, I've had sellers come to me and say oh well in this Facebook group they said just go open a new account that's going to get you suspended more like more than likely right away because Amazon tracks all of the data um, and so they're going to see okay well you know this person had another account their name or whatever or even their IP address um, it's related and so they're going to shut you down right away another thing I would say that I see a lot of com a lot of uh, a lot commonly with private label sellers is that they will buy generic items that are not their own items and they will try to list them on other brands listings I see this a lot unfortunately um, and so one thing I would say is that if you are gonna do a model where you're going to jump on a listing, as they call it, you need to make sure the item you're actually sending into the fulfillment center and offering to a customer is the actual item. Um, if you are selling your own brand, I would say get brand registry as soon as possible. Um, before you even get started with that, you need to make sure that whatever that brand name is you want to use is not trademark registered in the country you want to sell in. So a lot of times, you know, you'll think of this name of this brand and you'll be like, wow, and then you go to register it and it's taken. So that could cause you a lot of problems. Absolutely. Okay, we've got one question here. So he's saying, I'm about to start the business. I want to know how to get the utility bill because I don't live in the U.S. What are the best ways to open a rental property? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure what the first question, I mean, sorry, what the last question pertains to, but as far as utility bill, you don't always have to have a utility bill. Amazon will potentially take other forms of documentation. What they really want to just see is that like business documents, legal documents are great, and um, with your ID, your government ID. So if you're not in the state, if you do have a passport, if you have a government ID from the country that you live in, um, something like that, they basically, Amazon just wants to see that, hey, you know what, um, XYZ person is opening this account, and so I have this documentation that's gonna tell me that this person that's opening this account does have the documents to verify their identity. And I know sometimes Amazon will even do video chat interviews now to verify your identity. It's kind of another uh, you know, barrier that they're doing, uh, you know, just to kind of verify everything. So I would say don't worry about the utility bill because a lot of times you can use other forms of verification. Yeah. And uh, if you're based outside of, of the U.S., I mean, Amazon still accepts, you know, your passport or your bank statement or credit card. So, um, yeah, you, you don't necessarily need a utility bill. And I am, uh, you know, based outside of uh, the U.S. and I sell on Amazon U.S., so I haven't had an issue. I don't have a utility bill from the U.S. or anything. So, yeah, there should be a way to do that. Okay, Kelly's here with us, and she says, thanks. So, guys, any more questions for Tiffany, type them in the comments wherever you're watching from Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn, and Tiffany will be answering your questions. So Tiffany, you also mentioned, um, you know, VAs and consultants and a lot of uh, sellers, of course, we um, utilize the services of VAs and consultants and we give them access to our accounts. 
So I, I thought that was very interesting that you said, uh, you know, we should ask them if they are using different email addresses for each client. And so is that a possibility? And is that sort of a requirement that we should, um, you know, request from them that they should actually use a, different emails for each of their clients? I would recommend it. It's not something okay. that is necessarily written uh, black and white in terms of service. Like I said earlier, terms of service can be very gray. Um, and sometimes it's not even in terms of service. It's just kind of based on what you've seen, um, the patterns of Amazon. Sometimes terms of service doesn't really catch up to what Amazon's actually doing. So in 2020, there was a mass wave of the Section B, which is related account suspensions. And one of the reasons was because sellers were using consulting agencies and their accounts were getting tied to the consulting agency. Um, well, actually, they were getting tied to other sellers' accounts, but the connection was the consulting agency. So one thing was is that these consulting agencies were using, like, let's just say, support at XYZ Consulting for all of the different uh, clients that they had. So one thing that we've done at Ace of Amazon and other reputable agencies that we network with and, and know are trying to be kind of more proactive do is that they're using different email addresses for every client. Because what that is going to help kind of give you is an extra level barrier of protection so that Amazon can't come back and say, well, you know, hey, we've flagged your account for a suspension related to you know, Joe and Susie and all these other people's accounts and the main culprit was like this consulting agency that was using the same email address. So I would say, you know, it's not required, but to give like an extra layer of barrier protection there is just to ask the, the agency, hey, you know, do when you do you use sub account access, I would always require sub account access. I would never give anyone main account access. If you are selling on a personal plan, you won't have sub account access, but I recommend upgrading so that you can get that. And another thing I would do is I would say, you know, I would ask them, are you using um, different logins, different sub account logins for every client you're working with? And if they're not, then I would kind of ask them why and ask them potentially if they will be willing to do it. It's not that difficult. Um, yeah. Okay, interesting. And and that also applies for 3PL services, for example, right? Because a lot of us use 3PLs and give them access to um, you know, shipment creation and all. Yeah, I mean, with 3PLs, it tends to be, I would say, less at risk because they're kind of doing less within your account. It, it okay. also plays into what the consulting agency is doing within your account. So with 3PLs, you're giving them very limited access to like trade shipments, things like that. Um, but when you're dealing with, you know, the, the more access you're giving, um, that kind of puts you more potentially at risk. So yeah, that's a great point with 3PLs as well. Um, I actually have a 3PL that I use and they don't use um, different email addresses for every client. Um, potentially they should. But I honestly, from what I've seen in my experience, it has more to do with giving a third party a lot more sub account user, it's the user permission. Okay, got it. Yeah. So here's some follow up questions from um, Saheraja. So he's saying, does Amazon will know somehow if I open my second account in my family member's name, <laughs> if say my account is suspended? And he's got a follow up question to that. Similarly, will there be any issues if I open in a different marketplace? Do we need to follow the whole steps of getting rental property utility bills and other legals in that country? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the first question was, if you already, was it, I think he has an account. Yeah, he has an account suspended. So yeah, so if you are to open an account in your family member's name, uh, Saharaja, basically um, you could do that, but you need to make sure that your family member, whoever you're going to open it in, does not already have an account or has never had an account. And if they have had an account, that that account was closed, it wasn't suspended. Because if it was suspended, then Amazon will tie that to their old suspended account. Um, I would also say that you need to look at the IP address. So I don't know what IP address you were using for your old account. I recommend, again, using a VPN or using a hotspot. A hotspot is preferable, but I know that can get kind of expensive. Um, and everything for this new account needs to be completely different. Um, this is kind of what I would say is like a stealth account because you're really 
behind it running it, but the front person is a different entity. Um, I have clients that do, they have multiple accounts via the stealth method. Um, you just want to make sure you're kind of doing it where nothing ties to the suspended account. Like think of all the different data points. Um, nothing tied to that old account that's suspended is going to be tied to this new account. So like I said, um, I would use a different device, like whatever the laptop was you were using before, use a new one, um, you know, use a different IP address, so using a VPN or using a hotspot, and um, even the address. So I don't know what address you had on file for the old account, but you're going to need to use a different one, um, ideally for this new account, things like that. Right. And then he also asked about a different marketplace. So if he, yeah. Yeah, so if you're trying to, I don't know if your question specifically is that you're trying to open, um, let's say you were selling on Amazon India and your account got suspended and now you're trying to sell on Amazon.com. Um, yeah, if you're trying to open it under the same uh, legal entity and the old account was suspended of that legal entity, then yes, it's going to cause your problem. It, it, it comes down to, at the end of the day, the legal entity. Um, so let's say you did it under your name, Saharaja, um, whatever your last name is, and your, your social security number, or what, I don't know what you guys have in India for that, but you know, that information, basically, when you go to register on .com, it's going to do that. It's going to shut, it's going to connect and it's going to shut you down. Yeah. Right. So that's going to be very tricky um, as well, Saharaja. So yeah, just be very careful. Um, another thing that I've seen very commonly happen, uh, Tiffany, is um, product listings are taken down for hazmat, right? And um, a lot of these products are really not, you know, hazmat at all, and they're just regular products. So what's yeah. kind of happening over there? I mean, does Amazon have like a list of keywords and the bot just, uh, you know, picks up these keywords that are in in a listing and then just just blocks them because of that keyword. Is, is that what, what really happens? Sometimes it can do with either back end, which is what you won't see as a customer on the listing, or it can do with actual like words or phrases in the listing on the customer side. Um, and sometimes it has to do with the category. There can be a variety of different reasons. Now, if your product is being flagged as hazmat and it's not, you can, um, and I have this on my website, it's for free, the free download. You can download these exemption forms from Amazon Seller Central. Um, sometimes they're kind of hard to find. And you would just fill out the exemption form. You, there's two different ones. So there's one for battery products um, and there's one for non-battery products. And so then you would fill those out and then if Amazon approves it, you give them everything. It's like it's a type of form where you have to fill out certain fields in order to get it to save. So once you fill that out and you submit it to Amazon, if they approve it, then your product will be declassified as a hazmat product. But again, you don't want to do that to try to skirt the rules. So, uh, you know, if you know that your product is flammable or it's a potential like lithium ion battery. It is kind of potentially a hazmat item. You don't want to submit this exemption form to skirt the rules because number one, that's potentially illegal. And number two, your listing could get flagged and you could get suspended. And that would be a severe violation that Amazon may never let you come back from. Right. Yeah. So the one slide that you mentioned, you know, all of these things that we need to keep track of and there was uh um, you know, the, the, all of the, 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 the policy violations and uh, the customer, um, you know, complaints and all of those things, the NCX, whatever index, something like that. So yeah. all of those things that you had on your slide, what are really the top three things that people need to be really, really careful about and make sure that, you know, if those top three things, if there's a policy violation for those top two or three things, it's it's really critical and you've got to really address those issues uh, you know very quickly so one of the most critical things is if a customer complains that your product is useful as new or it's counterfeit because amazon is very customer centric and so they want happy customers and they want customers that receive items that are new if the listing said it was new it was new or if the listing said it was xyz they actually got xyz um, that's 
super like important. I would never let those linger. You want to address those as soon as you can. And you want to go back and look at your way that you're packaging your products, look at your listing description and details and say, is there any reason for, you know, legitimately the customer would have been confused and thought it was, you know, um, like maybe it got damaged in transit. That's why they said it's you sold as new. Or maybe, you know, my listing says it comes in this box and it doesn't come in this box. And so I need to remove that, you know, um, or I need to add the box. I need to make, I need to package my product and put it in this box. Um, another thing I would say is that intellectual property claim. So trademark, patent, or copyright. Amazon takes that very seriously because it's another brand claiming that you violated their intellectual property. So you want to make sure you have brand registry. If you're doing private label, if you're selling other brands' products, you want to make sure you're actually selling whatever that brand is. It's not counterfeit. It's not knockoff. It's not like, oh, it looks like it's the same. It sounds like it's the same. It is like it 100% is the same. And another thing I would say is that if you are doing merchant fulfilling, which is where you're shipping your items direct to consumer uh, via Amazon's platform, you need to watch your ODR, which is your order defect rate. So you want to ship your items on time. You want to make sure that you're properly prepping and packing your items before you ship them because, you know, here in the, in the States, USPS uh, or UPS can be kind of, wonky i know i have friends in india they've received merchant sold items and when it comes to them they're like this box is all dinged up so you don't want that happening so you want to make sure at the end of the day you're kind of having this mentality am i following the rules and am i providing great customer service and part of great customer service is your product is actually what you're saying it is and you're packaging it in a way so when it arrives to the customer they're not like what is this they're like wow i got what i ordered you know so i would say those are the top three things fantastic okay one last question from saharaja is there any automation software to know if your account is getting risk um not automation software but last year amazon uh ruled out rolled out they, this, um, what you saw, which the, the red, green, and the yellow. So it's like, it's in beta mode. So not all sellers have it, but you want to go into your Amazon account, look under account health, see if you have it. And it's a good indication if your account is at risk or not. Now I will tell you that if it's in the yellow, your account is at risk. And that could mean like from zero to, you know, a million. It could mean that your account is about to get suspended right away, or it could mean you've got some time, you need to take care of it. So it, the best indicator is to go in to your performance notifications. If there's anything you've not addressed, you need to address it like right away. Um, like, for example, I had one recently that was like Amazon was uh, saying my, my items were counterfeit. I had to submit all my invoices for this one ASIN. Um, and also your account health. So the more claims that you see piling up, the more you're at risk and it's based on volume. There's not a formula that Amazon has published, but this is just from what I've seen. Um, it's based on volume. So there are sellers that I know that are doing, you know, 65 million a year on Amazon and they could have potentially a hundred claims and not get suspended, but the 101 claim is gonna shut them down. And there are sellers that are doing $20,000 a month um, you know, in revenue and they get five claims and they get shut down. So it's all based on volume. So I would say to answer your question in a long winded way, go into account health, look at all of those claims and say, how can I start cleaning up these claims or at least letting Amazon know, Hey, I understand I made a mistake. I, you know, this item was expired and I apologize. I've done a removal order, things like that. So that is my answer for that question. That is fantastic. And um, guys, you should definitely follow uh, Tiffany's channel on Instagram, Eat Sleep Amazon. She shares a lot of great information. <laughs> I follow you. you regularly, Tiffany. So thank yeah, you. great job over there. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany, for your time today and for sharing all of this uh, great information. So guys, this is Tiffany's email address, account health at eatsleepamazon.com. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them. Yeah, okay. thanks so much, Megla. It's been a pleasure, and thanks to the audience for all of your questions. All right, you have a great day, Tiffany. Bye. You too. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so let's move on to our next presentation. Now from selling on Amazon and suspensions on Amazon, we are going to be talking about sourcing. And for that, I have with me my good friend, Francois Jeffrey from Noviland. Hi, Francois, how are you doing? 
And you're muted. <laughs> muted. Do you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm doing great, Megla. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot for joining us today, Francois. And you're traveling today and you've still made the time to uh, do this presentation. So really, really appreciate that. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking about sourcing and what importers need to know about sourcing in 2021. So let's get st straight into it. Do you want to share your uh, slides? Yeah, and, yeah um, let me go and let's share those. Tiffany's going to be see... a hard one to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I see Lisa has joined us here. Hi, Lisa. Really nice to see you here. <laughs> So we're going to talk. We're going to be talking about sourcing, guys. And if you have any questions about uh, sourcing from China, uh, Francois is the person to answer all of those questions. He's got a lot of experience in sourcing, logistics, supply chain management. <laughs> <laughs> Let me share this, and I appreciate that. And I have that up now. Yes. So, okay. do you want to just go full screen? Yes. Oh wrong thing <laughs> there we go perfect so yeah it's an uh, it's an exciting topic oh uh, well it's not exciting to to a lot but i think right now the landscape itself is changing so dynamically every week we are seeing something new that's going on um, whether that is sourcing whether that is logistics so this is a topic that of course is you know the foundation to every single e-commerce business Anything that's product oriented, particularly if you're sourcing from China, but really if you're so sourcing globally, I think a lot of these uh, topics are going to apply. And, and I think they're going to be very important to succeed uh, at the end of the day online and uh, ultimately beat out your competition. So uh, just to list out a few of the topics that we're going to go through. Uh, so we are going to have a few housekeeping items just to, to touch on, and then we'll dive right into sourcing and logistics. We'll chat about some innovative solutions that I would I could propose, and, and we've seen a lot of our uh, users and customers be very successful with. Uh, and that's all the way from those sellers that are just starting out through the eight and nine figure sellers uh, that we get to talk to on our podcast sometimes as well. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Uh, if you haven't seen me before, I uh, am the director of business development here in Noviland and the co-host of Link Up Leaders podcast. I'm not sure if you've heard that, but if you haven't, definitely go check out Megla's episode. She dropped a lot of knowledge when it came to sourcing from India, particularly, um, and joined by my great co-host, Lisa Kinski, as well. And uh, so my background is in industrial engineering, and it was more of a focus on supply chain as well. And so I, I've been able to d have the privilege to actually look into supply chain primarily between China and the U.S., but China globally also uh, every single day for the past five years uh, since I joined the team as, as just an intern. Uh, and it really is such a privilege because we've seen the dynamic change from all the way, you know, through the trade war. We've seen how that was impacted uh, and how I know a lot of businesses were looking immediately to just start sourcing elsewhere. Uh, a lot of them did come to the realization that there are great other countries to diversify to, but it's also very difficult. Um, so there are challenges there, and uh, there was a lot of active problem solving, which I was very excited about. Um, and last thing, I really wanted to touch on housekeeping, which I think is just not talked about enough. And it always tends to creep up on companies as if it didn't happen the year before. Um, but a few notable dates, Labor Day is coming up in just a few days. Uh, so a lot of factories and offices are going to be closed. Uh, some may be working through Labor Day, uh, particularly, you know, smaller factories or factories that have deadlines to meet. Um, but just keeping that in mind, if you are reaching out to them to get any status updates, I would recommend reaching out today uh, and really making sure that they need to get those to you before Labor Day. Um, or if you're OK with, you know, post Labor Day, and that's that's great as well. Um, but keeping in mind, you know, Dragon Boat Festival, Mid-Autumn uh, Festival, Golden Week. Golden Week's a big one that uh, a lot of companies don't tend to experience, particularly newer companies, but they don't experience the pain of that uh, unless they are going through this, you know, uh, we call it the three W's, but really working water warehousing. Essentially, you have... Uh, uh, something being done at every step of the supply chain, whether that is from the manufacturing aspect, so the, the working, uh, something on the water, which is, of course, the transport, uh, and then something in the warehouse. So Golden Week tends to um, really impact a lot of newer businesses that don't really realize that this one week impacts several weeks in the supply chain. Um, 
and this, uh, you know, Chinese New Year is something that I will never let go. That's something that I will always bring up as early as possible, uh, particularly today, because we we don't know how the supply chain is going to be impacted. If we're going to see another Suez Canal situation, for example, if raw materials prices are just going to continue to skyrocket, um, all points that we're also going to talk about today. So based on the last thing that I said and something that I think was a major topic in supply chain uh, is the Suez Canal. Uh, this was one of my favorite memes. I was just talking to Carlos Alvarez and, and he asked me about my favorite meme and this was actually it. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I brought that in. Uh, but a, a lot of businesses might see this as just impacting the China EU or India EU trade route through the Suez Canal. Uh, but what you know, a lot of businesses don't realize that it's actually a global impact. So 12% of global trade goes to the Suez Canal. Um, and just based on that, you know, that ever given that was stuck there, uh, there were 25 delayed ships that were supposed to be going either to or from the US. And that was from the, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Uh, and then the residual impact of that was, of course, what we saw was hundreds of containers uh, that were impacted or, or, or container ships that were impacted because of this. Um, and so although it seems like something that's very minor and very isolated to just the EU, we are starting to see a lot of those impacts um, in the pricing, in the lead times, uh, in the container shortages. Uh, so right now, particularly, you know, building up on everything that we saw from COVID, we are starting to see increased blank sailings to the EU or uh, what, what a lot of companies might know as rolled cargo. Um, and we're also seeing price spikes, uh, some price spikes that are completely ridiculous, completely unprecedented. Um, but that's that's really across the board. It's not just your freight forwarder that is increasing these prices for you. Um, and that's going to the US, that's going to the EU, and, and that's whether it's from China or India or anywhere else, we are seeing this global impact. Uh, again, not just from the Suez Canal, this is residual also from COVID. Um, but because of that, we are seeing the shortages. We're seeing the booking times uh, are also increasing dramatically. Uh, I know we were just talking to Carlos, and, and in some instances, he was seeing up to five to six weeks ahead of time that he had to start booking. Um, and tr the traditional method is maybe, you know, you reach out to your supplier. They probably have a partner. And, and if they don't, then then you're working with your partner and your supplier um, and usually coordinating within a one to two week window. Um, so this does tie up. Uh, some of your time or maybe some of your logistics team time, uh, but it is completely necessary. Um, and there are alternatives to just standard ocean freight that we'll also touch on. Um, another thing to note is that spot market rates are they're, uh, very, very dynamic at this moment. Um, one week you might see, let's see, let's say going from, you know, Shanghai to the East Coast, you might see $9,000. And the next week, if you don't have that spot market booked, uh, you might see that same same container going for $12,000. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, if you're shipping full container loads, uh, it, it's not going to make a tremendous difference. But when you're moving several, I think this is where uh, a lot of businesses are going to suffer because of the, uh, again, the residual impacts of not just that cost, but also we're looking at port congestion. We're looking at uh, delayed trucking times and uh, potentially, you know, longer uh, truck wait times. Uh, so, so these are all uh, additional costs that businesses are going to have to start to incorporate into their model. Um, of course, this accentuates the container shortage. That, that's that been something that's been going on for the past year. Um, and so uh, one solution that a lot of businesses are tend to be going is just diversifying how they're shipping. Uh, so instead of going with a 40 foot full container load, they may be, you know, splitting up into smaller shipments, maybe 120 foot and a few LCLs uh, just really varies on, on what makes sense most for your business and, and what sort of cost you can eat. Um, and then port surcharges. This is something that I don't think a lot of businesses knew about. Uh, but when they were going particularly with, with cheaper freight forwarders, they started to encounter these down the road. So they might be locked into a phenomenal rate compared to everyone else, let's say about $7,000 going to the East Coast. Uh, and then when they uh, have their containers actually arrive uh, prior to, to checking into customs, they're starting to see these port surcharges. And their freight forwarder may say, hey, we can't release this unless you actually pay these. 
Um, and I know I was looking at one to Australia and that was adding up to be close to $2,000 uh, for one container just for port surcharges because of the, uh, the congestion there. So definitely talk to them, be as open as you can about, you know, what costs you can eat, what costs you can't eat, uh, and make sure they're outlining exactly what it is you're paying for. If it's your final price and they say that, uh, then make sure they're also honoring that. And so just kind of diving a little bit deeper into shipping costs and, and booking times, uh, because I know this is something that I've, I've sort of talked about, but we need to see some of these numbers. I think a lot of businesses don't tend to, uh, they, they, they tend to only go with the one partner that they're seeing, but these rates fluctuate, right? What you might be getting for $7,000, someone else might be getting from the same freight forwarder for nine or $10,000. Um, so these are just some of the costs that uh, I've definitely seen range. Uh, and this also depends on which mode you choose to go with. So if you you choose to go with, of course, a, a standard ocean freight, you are going to see longer transport times, uh, likely longer check-in times as well. And those tend to be on the lower range. Um, but there are other solutions. So there's expedited ocean freight, for example, which is going to be on the upper end of, uh, uh, of the pricing. Uh, but what that means is that you also are able to get your products here quicker. Uh, and when I say quicker, I mean just about uh, as long as it took you about two years ago to get this in with standard ocean freight uh, because of these ports being so overwhelmed uh, uh, with vessels. And um, just to put into perspective, I, I, I spoke to to someone and they said that the, the Long Beach ports and, and the West Coast ports of Oakland, Long Beach, uh, all these ports are still seeing dozens of vessels being backed up. So these, these check-in times are still taking a lot longer it's still overwhelming customs uh, for for inspections um, so if you do get hit with a CET exam uh, just be mindful that you know that might take a little bit longer because they're transporting it to the warehouse they need to inspect the container they need to write the report and then they could release it um, so it's important to note these um, and these prices uh, I, I think a lot of businesses particularly as they started to scale up and and you know they uh, they didn't realize costs will get this bad. Uh, we'll find these as completely ridiculous uh, and intangible because it, it does price out a lot of their 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 products, particularly if they're larger products, because the, the cost per unit is going to continue to go up. Um, there's no particular end in sight. There's no one that can for sure put their finger on it and say in six months this is going to be over. Um, so no matter who it is that you're speaking with, just make sure that uh, you also are mindful that this is all very dynamic. They can go back to normal in the next six months or they can continue going up. Uh, and I think with the, the global container shortage just sticking around that this we're going to see this pricing at least for the rest of the year, uh, maybe even in the 2022. We'll have to see how things go uh, with more things shifting to e-commerce uh, and, and global trade just increasing. Uh, Express Air, uh, that's another topic I think a lot of businesses uh, care a lot about because they see it as uh, 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 an option that would help them move their cargo quicker no matter what. Um, and traditionally it is. Traditionally it is, uh, you know, something that is going to get, get it there a lot quicker. It is a little bit slower than usual. Um, so it might be twice as long as it usually takes for Express Air. Um, and the pricing is Definitely well over what you were paying this time last year, two years ago, even last year, I think it was it was still pretty elevated, actually. Um, but as we start to see passenger airlines and, and commercial flights uh, increasing, we hopefully will start to see some of these express air shipments uh, and, and costs start to go down. Um, so right now, it, $9 is just about an average uh, of what I've been seeing. Of course, you can get better rates. Um, you get what you pay for at the end of the day, uh, or you can get more expensive rates. And if you're relying only on your supplier to cost those out for you, uh, and, and they don't have the right partners in place uh, or the right shipping agents, then you may be seeing those higher rates. I've seen some as high as $15 per kilogram, um, just depending on where it's going and, and you know the volume of the product. Uh, so it really depends on what you're shipping and uh, making sure that you can cost that into your to your uh, to your pricing and, and at the end of the day come up with your cost of goods sold um, and then booking time this is something that i was just talking about um, but at a very minimum 
you want to start reaching out to your freight forwarders at least four weeks in advance. That's an entire month in advance. Uh, and this is going to be tricky because I am mindful that, you know, your factories likely can't say it's going to be done exactly on this date. There may be some hiccups. There may be uh, things that go on. But starting those conversations early will 100% put you ahead of the game when it comes to you versus your competitor. Um, and you're also going to be able to account for things like world cargo. Uh, and for anyone that's not familiar with what world cargo is, uh, it's essentially when you hear your supplier say, um, your, your cargo missed this boat, it's going to go on the next boat. Uh, it is, they essentially will roll your cargo because you are not able to get on that flight they, or the, on that flight on that boat. Um, they might have overbooked the boat, which is a, a very much a possibility. Uh, they might uh, be delaying boats because of the port congestion, uh, both on the export and on the import side. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that this may happen, and that's why you want to account for that in those three to five weeks ahead of time, uh, ahead of your, your product being finished. And then just keeping in mind, of course, the spot rates that uh, I'm mentioning here right now. And cost of, yeah, cost of raw materials. Um, I think this is another topic of conversation that um, a lot of people are being stunned with. A lot of businesses did not have these conversations early on with their suppliers. They did not uh, start to see the cost and these raw materials start to go up. Um, but this is a topic that has actually been talked about since last year. Um, and factories have brought this up many times, uh, particularly as we're talking about, you know, plastics and resins. And uh, today uh, I, I just spoke to, uh, to to my good friend that handles a real estate investment. And he's seeing cost of uh, building materials and lumber uh, be one and a half times what it was last year. So oh. it's it's very important to keep in mind that uh, cost of raw materials are going up and they're going to up across the board, whether that's with your packaging, whether that's with your uh, your plastic resin that makes your products, whether that's with the wood that goes into your product, uh, metal, uh, no matter what it is, they're all going up. Um, and you can keep track of this through something called the PPI or the producer price index. Uh, it essentially will outline uh, what are consumers, or in this case, what are manufacturers willing to pay for these raw materials. Um, and these are tricky situations because it's it's a tough time for a business to decide, well, how much can I eat? How much do I need to negotiate uh, with my supplier? Uh, and how much can I pass along to my consumer and still stay you know, competitive uh, versus my other competitors? Uh, but it's important to note that, uh, you know, it, as, as dynamic as this landscape is changing, uh, it's not something that you're going to be able to answer necessarily in the next month or in the next two months. Uh, this is something that is going to have to be likely a six to eight month term, just like we saw uh, with the trade wars when those first started um, and how we're seeing with, with Brexit and how the UK is being impacted. Um, so these are not short term pivots that you'll have to make or decisions that you'll have to make. Uh, it is very much, you know, you'll have to decide how much inventory you'll want to store, uh, how that affects your capital uh, overall and uh, how effective your supply chain is, right? Finding ways to minimize other costs, such as uh, transportation, such as negotiating better payment terms, potentially, uh, with your supplier. So we'll dive into the, uh, the innovative solutions here in a while, but uh, if anyone has questions on PPI, uh, I highly suggest uh, you, you ask them, you definitely look it up, familiarize yourself with them. Um, and this is gonna be different than CPI, what a lot of uh, uh, sellers that I've spoken to are more familiar with, more of the consumer price index. Um, so definitely look more into PPI. And One of the questions that I, you know, just had is like, why are mm -hmm. raw material costs increasing? I mean, what's, and it's, it's happening across the board in China and India, but mm -hmm. you know, what do you think are the reasons behind this uh, cost increase? Well, there, there's several reasons. Um, there's not one that you can particularly pinpoint. Uh, but one, we have to keep in mind that globally, everything is opening back up. And this is a very, very good thing for the economy. This is signaling that our economies are getting back to normal because we are spending more. Um, and so there's increased demand. With increased demand, there's typically going to be elevated price. Uh, now, there's a lot more that goes into it. 
the cost of fuel, for example, the container shortage, uh, the, the the capacity of manufacturers to produce the products using the raw materials. So there's there's various levels that go into it. So there's not a single thing that you can say. Um, I guess the blanket answer is that uh, the economies are starting to pick back up and we are starting to see manufacturers need these raw materials more. So the demand spike is going to uh, cause the, uh, the price uh, spike as well. Right. Makes sense. Yeah, basic uh, economics. <laughs> uh, and aside from that, uh, innovative solutions. Uh, it's it's something that, uh, again, there's no one solution, just like there's no one sourcing method, there's no one logistics method uh, that is going to help your business particularly. Uh, you will have to weigh your options. You will have to see what sort of relationships you have in place, uh, even what sort of resources you have in place to, to you know, uh, execute on these solutions. Uh, but a few of them are, are definitely talking to your freight forwarder about expedited ocean freight. Uh, and if it's not something they're very familiar with, uh, definitely looking to shop around because that can save you at least two to three weeks on just ocean freight itself. Uh, and we all know with no inventory, there's no sales. With no sales, there's no money coming in. Um, so it's important to, to, to keep that in mind. Uh, also booking far ahead, you know, it's something that I, I continue pounding, uh, and that's because it is important. There is no such thing right now, at least, as doing business as usual. Uh, you have to, you know, change with this dynamic landscape. You have to be willing to uh, reach out to them three, four, five weeks ahead. Let them know these are my cargo ready dates, or some may know it as CRDs. Um, and if there's delays, communicating those with them, uh, because at the end of the day, they need to rebook them most likely. And if you just keep pushing it all, uh, all on them last second, you are going to see those premium costs uh, because that's the solution that they're going to come up with. Um, another solution when it comes to logistics is definitely splitting. Uh, so what I mentioned earlier, you know, if you are traditionally shipping 40 foot containers, uh, although you might not see the cost savings necessarily, and in some cases you are, uh, you might even be just, you know, breaking even, um, on what you were traditionally paying for a 40 foot container. Uh, but consider splitting that into smaller shipments. Uh, and that way you reduce the risk of that, you know, 40 foot container getting stuck at customs or, uh, being on one of the vessels that's just backed up and waiting to be checked in. So consider splitting your cargo. It's, it's definitely a great option. Um, and you could work with your freight forwarder to cost those models out as well. Um, and then freight forwarders that you've, you've dismissed before. And, and I, you know, uh, I, I've just spoken to Carlos and, and, uh, Carlos Alvarez of the wizards of e-commerce. And, and he mentioned FedEx actually, believe it or not, not too many people use FedEx when it comes to ocean freight. Uh, but right now it looks like the rates may be, uh, pretty competitive compared to the rest of the market. Um, so uh, keeping in mind that, you know, there aren't just the, the smaller freight forwarders that can help you, but there are these major carriers that traditionally have been dismissed, uh, but by a lot of businesses, uh, but might be viable options nowadays. Uh, storage diversification, just like every other part of your supply chain, it's always a good idea to diversify. Um, so looking into new 3PL partners, looking into how much can your factory actually store for you? Uh, can you store domestically? That way you only have to worry about the ocean freight or the uh, just international freight in general. Um, so it's really important that we don't just rely on this just-in-time manufacturing that we've grown so accustomed to uh, when supply chain is in full motion and all the links are very strong. Uh, just in time works out very well. Uh, and it's, you know, you're able to rely on your factory producing 30 days and you could count for the 30 days with ocean freight, maybe a, a week for checking into to Amazon uh, FBA. Uh, we can't do that nowadays. Uh, it's, it's simply not a viable option. Uh, it increases the, the risk tremendously for any business. Um, so diversifying your supply chain is definitely a good idea here. Uh, and then when it comes to sourcing, I mean, it's something that I think every business always thinks about. Um, but what you will notice there is I, I'm not <clears throat> focusing too much on 
uh, negotiating product prices. Uh, now, it's going to be important to negotiate pr product prices to make sure that the raw materials stay low. Uh, and it's probably even a good idea to start getting quotes from other suppliers because we are looking more upstream now. When the cost of raw materials are going up, uh, those raw material suppliers are the ones pro uh, you know, uh, supplying those to the manufacturers that are producing the items or that are using those raw materials and converting them into products um, or parts and pieces. So if they don't have the raw, uh, if they don't have the right upstream supply chain in place, uh, you will see even higher price increases than some of your competitors. So it's really important to diversify when it comes to sourcing. Uh, keeping open communication with them is very important. Um, I know one innovative solution is you know virtual meetings. Uh, if you can't go in person, uh, hiring a translator. This relationship right now is more important than ever. Uh, without your supplier and without a, a tight partnership with them, uh, th this is a time that your business could definitely suffer. So it's important to uh, to keep keep in mind that you want to continue building those relationships with them. Uh, payment terms, something that we've covered. Versioning products, uh, it's something that we've seen, uh, I think, a lot more recently, uh, particularly because of raw materials. But having various versions of your product, maybe a, not necessarily a lower end, but a version one and a version two, uh, could be a great idea because then you could change up the materials in it, uh, you could change up the pricing models, uh, and you could show the value to the consumers. Uh, and that way you could justify the raw material price increases and uh, eventually the, the price increases that you're going to pass along to them. Um, also, value add bundles. Uh, if you're selling, I don't know, uh, tissue holders, potentially incorporate some tissues in there, um, and that could boost up some of your your selling prices. So that's another idea that you can definitely have. Um, but PPI, that's something that you know I did mention before, and it's something that I think every business should be tracking, uh, even if they weren't before. Um, as a producer's price index, keeping in mind that when that goes up, your costs are going to go up too. Um, when that goes down, you want to make sure you have those conversations with those manufacturers. And you could sector those off by category. It is a little bit harder. Um, and you have to make sure that you're looking in the country that you're manufacturing. Um, but it's definitely doable. All the information is out there. Uh, every Bureau of Statistics for every country that's that's mass manufacturing anything will have these PPIs uh, listed out. And, and you can likely find them by category as well. Uh, but aside from that, uh, I know that was a, a, a lot of information to just sort of digest into a small amount of time. Um, but I definitely want to you know, open the floor to any questions that anyone might have, and uh, whether that's raw materials, general supply chain issues with your supplier, anything. I'd be love to. Uh, I'd love to answer those questions. Well, thanks a lot for that, Francois. I think that was a very comprehensive. Um, presentation over there. I'm just going to remove your slides from the screen. Okay. There we go. Okay, cool. So yeah, guys, if you have any questions about sourcing, type them in the comments now. Um, Francois will be able to answer any questions that you might have um, about sourcing, negotiate, negotiating with suppliers, um, raw material prices, uh, <laughs> anything at all related to, to sourcing. So, um, you know, Francois, uh, COVID, of course, has changed so much <laughs> in sourcing and, you know, in everything um, around the world, but specifically in sourcing, how do you think you and your your clients and, and buyers that you know, how do you think they're managing things like, um, you know, quality control and finding suppliers when they can't really travel to China, there are no trade shows happening and there are no factory visits happening. And that was such an important part of sourcing. Um, I mean, it was almost unthinkable. I mean, if you're a big buyer, you're placing large orders, it's almost unthinkable of placing an order with a factory without first visiting it and auditing the factory yourself. So how do you think, you know, buyers that you deal with and, and you cater to, how have they changed with um, all of the travel restrictions and, and, and COVID? Well, I think they're looking at new solutions like ones that you're providing, uh, like the virtual uh, India sourcing trip. I think that's one that uh, a lot of companies are just looking at because they can't travel to India to, to find that solution. Uh, but I think this is really a time where a lot of businesses realize that uh, you can't do everything yourself. Uh, and it's hard, right? Especially as a growing business and as a growing 
whether it's an online seller or you want to call yourself an Amazon seller, uh, you feel that you, you feel the need that you have to control this entire process. Uh, when in reality, there are great partners out there that you could rely on, uh, and building relationships with them is just as important as building a relationship directly with your supplier. Um, so when it comes to, to to quality control, when it comes to uh, factory auditing, when it comes to even the meetings with the factory, uh, I think everyone is looking for new innovative solutions to that. Uh, and whether that is just doing virtual meetings and hiring a translator to go out there, uh, I think that itself shows the factory great initiative that, hey, I'm willing to pay for a translator. I'm willing to you know, uh, take the time. I don't care if it's 2 a.m. my time. That's yeah, If that's going to be for you, we're going to do that. Um, I think this is a moment that uh, a moment that sucks for a lot, but a lot can capitalize on it and build some of the strongest relationships they could ever have, uh, because the factories also realize uh, that this is tough. That this is uh, you know they are losing business because they can't have businesses visiting them. Um, so it's um it, it, it's a dynamic market. It it requires innovative solutions uh, and, and it requires trust. So it's finding you know the right partners out there finding ways to relation, uh, build the relationships and, and trusting that those relationships will be maintained. Yeah, absolutely. I think relationships are just so important, whether you're sourcing from China or India or any other country. And now is the time to, you know, sort of leverage on that relationship. If you did have a good relationship with your supplier, now's the time to um, really leverage on that relationship. Okay, awesome. So guys, do you have any questions for Francois? Type them in the comments now. We're going to start wrapping up this session of the Global Sources Virtual Summit. Um, and um, let's take any final questions for Francois. So uh, Francois, do you also want to talk about Noviland and tell people exactly how you help uh, importers source products from China and uh, even a few other countries? Yeah, well, right now it's only China. Uh, <laughs> so, so we are focused mostly in China, and that's why I was I was able to uh, to talk more about the China side than than anything else. But uh, Noviland's a it's an innovative solution to a complex problem, uh, which is the supp supply chain. And I think a lot of businesses did business as usual for most of their you know uh, business life, I guess, or their company life. Um, but when issues like these arise, I think this is where they need to find new innovative solutions. So what, what Noviland provides is that supply chain solution at every stack of the, uh, every piece of the stack. So whether that is the sourcing, whether that's logistics, QC, um, 3PL and fulfillment, uh, we're able to incorporate all of this and centralize it in one platform. Uh, and, and just make it super easy to use. So instead of you know uh, working with a factory and then working with a QC inspection and then working with a freight forwarder and then finding a 3PO and coordinating all these, which usually requires a team, uh, we have the team in place to actually work with a business and help them scale up their operations, uh, all while doing it in one place with one team. Fantastic. Okay, we've got one question for you, Francois. Sahaya Raja is asking, one of the best negotiating tips for us? Uh, well, I think it's approaching it as uh, what can you do for them? Not just what you need, not just I need this to be a dollar or I need this to be, you know, a dollar fifty. It's, hey, how can we achieve, uh, the, you know, this pricing together? Uh, and if that is you can't order a thousand, you have to order fifteen hundred and you can't order 1500 because you have nowhere to store the additional 500, then it's finding innovative solutions together. And, and this all ties back to relationship building. Um, but it's it's finding solutions together and not just you know taking, 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 which I see is one of the biggest downfalls for a lot of sellers that could be taking this opportunity to, to build a great relationship. Um, so I, I guess the, to, to boil that down, it's giving as much as you're taking when it comes to negotiations. Okay, Donald Black is asking, where can I find a trusted source for Astate sunglasses for my brand? So one of the things that you could do, Donald, is uh, go to the Global Sources website. So go to globalsources.com and uh, search for suppliers of sunglasses over there. Uh, you can contact suppliers directly. All of the suppliers on the Global Sources platform are verified companies. They are legitimate companies and Global Sources has checked that they they have actual business licenses and they are real um, exporters so you can definitely try to find suppliers over there if you need a more sort of a done for you service you can reach out to noviland and um, you know uh, francois you can probably 
explain a little bit about how Noviland can help with this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like you said, it is very much a done for you service. Um, and we do primarily have larger factories. So uh, just trying to get on, you know, less than MOQs typically, uh, we're not the strongest in. So it, it is typically higher dollar value. Uh, let's say, you know, five to $8,000 minimum uh, typically is, is what our factories are looking for. So uh, you would just submit an RFQ, our team would go ahead, take care of it, get you quotes, coordinate samples. Uh, you can see shipping prices immediately to FBA centers or to your 3PL or your residential address, whatever the case may be. Um, but I know Global Source is a, a lot of our users actually use both. Uh, so, so they might want to do some of it themselves and use Global Sources. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you know it, it's something that they're looking to scale up, they might use uh, Noviland. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so guys, definitely check out uh, Francois and um, Lisa's podcast. Um, it's really good. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your podcast and where can people find more information about it? Yeah, uh, definitely Google Link Up Leaders. Uh, and if you Google Link Up Leaders uh, Megla, you will come up with Megla's <laughs> amazing show or uh, her episode. Um, it, it's really something that uh, sparked out of necessity and that isn't talked about enough uh, because we, we wanted to link supply chain with e-commerce because it is the foundation to any e-commerce business. Uh, so what we look to do is, is really accentuate uh, what goes on in supply chain, how businesses have grown. And, and we find these amazing leaders such as yourself to actually come on and talk about what they're experts in or what they've you know done themselves. Um, so it's really just honest, hour long conversations uh, of, of amazing content that I think every business can benefit from. Um, uh, that's a that's a little bit about it. Awesome. So guys, check out Link Up Leaders on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, and I guess all of the podcasting platforms as well. Yeah, wherever you find your podcast. <laughs> awesome. Well, Francois, thank you so much for your time today. It was um, a really insightful presentation, a lot of valuable information. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you, Megla. All right. You take care. I'll see you around. Bye. All right. Bye. Okay, guys, so with that, we come to the end of session two of Global Sources Virtual Summit, April 2021. But we will be back for session three tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Hong Kong time. If you're joining us from the U.S., then that's going to be 8 p.m. today. Um, so don't forget to join us. Uh, we are streaming live on the Global Sources Facebook channel, Global Sources YouTube, and also Global Sources LinkedIn. You can also sign up and register for the conference uh, in order to receive all of the speakers slides, the agenda and the replays, just head over to globalsources.com forward slash summit to register for the conference. All right, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, thanks a lot, Tim, for joining us again for the second session as well. Um, really nice of you to stay until the end. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us as well. And um, Okay, guys, so I will see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Hong Kong time. Bye.